<laughs> Hi, my name is Cindy Landreth, and I'm from Transition Wacom. And we're here to talk about uh, the uh, multiple scales of transition work, as well as um, working with existing groups and re doing re um, outreach um, with things that are already going on in your community. Um, these are my grandkids up here. That's Roman and Giovanna. They're twins. They'll be four in um, uh, the day before Halloween. And their daddy's taking them on a walk in the woods. And he's doing his very best to build resilience into their very being. And uh, they've been on an 11-mile hike. They didn't even know it. They loved every minute of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, am, I was part of the initiating group for Transition Wacom. And uh, we had eight people that um, got the, trans the T for T training and uh, at two different times got together and created a group of eight people, four women, four men, and um, the, d the diversity of the group itself led to whether or not we wanted to be an initiating group for Bellingham or whether we wanted to be an initiating group for the county as a whole or what. Um, whether we wanted to break into groups and start neighborhoods. Um, we decided that we wanted to focus a lot on um, working together as a group because we, for, for several reasons, which I'll get into in a little bit, but I was part of that initi initiating group. My, my personal passion for this transition work is a lot to do with the fact that we need to do the transitioning at the very smallest of levels. So if you think about multiple scales, that's where it all started for me as, and sold me on this work. This is just so important. Whatever we do out here at the larger scale won't mean anything if the very seed is, is not strong. So uh, multiple scales starts, starts there. Um, so that's a little bit about me and the transition movement itself. Um, I'm also a permaculturist, which helps me frame a lot of the decision making that I do as I'm part of the transition town movement. It's a, a critical piece to me. I'm also a residential designer, and a, a pattern language happened to be one of the books of my dreams when I was in college. I studied Christopher Alexander for years, and then was so thrilled when Rob Hopkins discovered him, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen from there. Um, now back to Transition Whatcom. Uh, Whatcom County is uh, 200,000 people, and it seemed a little silly to start with a seed that was that small, or excuse me, that large, when I'm talking about how important it is to start small. But Whatcom County has already got um, sustainable connections was birthed there. I'm, you know, many people are familiar with that. It's a buy local campaign. It's a, um, a business, sustainable business practices. It's um, food, connecting the food and the restaurant, or the farmers and the restaurants. It, they're already doing so much work. In fact, my husband and I were part of the uh, founding board members of that organization. So um, there was that going on. There was the farm friends going on. There was the uh, resources going on, which was in the schools educating. There were so many things going on already that we knew that as soon as we brought this forward, it would be like we, we, we would never be able to keep up. We needed to start at a, at a teenage level instead of at an infant level. But at the same time, we were a young group. We needed to also start as, a, you know, as an infant and just begin this process. And so we were having to hold both at the same time. How many in here are trying to do anything like that, where you're in a large community and a tiny community at the same time and make decisions for both levels? That was constant confusion constantly trying to figure out, okay, which level are we at? And if you can bring that, here's my one piece that I would say, if you can bring that to the awareness of each decision you're making, which level are we talking about? Because you'll, you'll make your meetings go a lot smoother, less, less arguing, because you don't know who, what, what your partners are thinking of. You know, make sure you're all talking about the same level of scale. So um, Whatcom County is, you know, it does have 200,000 people. The city of Bellingham has um, about 80, 85,000. Um, we're very lily white. We have 1.1% um, oh, of the population, I think, is black. 3.8 uh, is Latino. 3 is Asian, but pretty white, pretty rural. 
Um, and uh, the, the diverse, uh, diversity that you see in most counties where the urban and the rural are real different politically as well, or their lifestyles are at least different. Um, so our initiating group had members from the rural, uh, count the rural areas as well as the um, urban areas. So that was also an indicator for us. Why did we want to be a hub? That was pretty important. Uh, we decided we wanted to be a hub was um, we wanted to give the message that we all are part of this. Whatcom County needs to think of itself as a whole because the cities need the county, the rural areas, we need the farmlands. It also is giving the message that we will stand up for the farmlands and protect the farmlands. We all need them. It's, you know, there, there's a, so much, um, so much power in uh, when, when somebody has that feeling of working together and finding common ground where you didn't expect it. So we wanted to frame it right from the go ahead that we're all in this together. We need energy. We the whole county needs energy. We can start it at micro level or we can start it at the county wide level or we can work at it at both levels. We also had I forgot to mention this. We also had an, an energy descent act or excuse me a uh, yeah, an EDAP, I guess, but they called themselves ERSPO. But there was a team already formed that was trying to create an energy descent action plan. At least that was their initial idea going on with the county government and the city government. It, it ended up with basically saying, watch what Transition Wacom is doing. That was the message, and then they let it go. So hope, and a lot of those people are part of the Transition Wacom group. So they are still doing that work. Uh, on our way down here, uh, Adam, uh, Adam Ward was sharing a little bit about what his experience was with the, the size, the scale, and that kind of thing, um, what impacted him. And I, I wanted to read what he had to say this morning because I thought it was really important. He says, if it had been a transition town, Bellingham, it could have exacerbated the um, tension that's between the green urban life of Bellingham and the culturally conservative rural life. It just would have exacerbated it even more. So when you think about that question, do I want to, do I want to start small? Do I want to include some rural and some urban and suburbs? What do I, you know, where do we draw the line? That's a good question to, to keep, or a key, good comment to keep in mind is that it's, it can be divisive rather than what you're really shooting for. I made a big mistake right at the very beginning. I used the word umbrella. The transition Wacom was going to be an umbrella group that would include everybody. I was really trying to be inclusive. And Sustainable Connections, who happened to be very good friends of mine, went, you know, we've been doing all this work for so long. What are you talking about? Why don't we come over? Why don't you guys come over for dinner? We'll talk, you know, maybe. <laughs> You know, but um, I quickly learned, and I, I had a vision. This was the vision. This is a crazy quilt. A crazy quilt is, in th this model, I'm going to make it really snappy here, <laughs> is each organization and each transition initiative has a piece of the fabric here. Just like in a crazy quilt, where your grandfather's pants that didn't wear out right there, now they're part of the quilt. Your grandmother's apron didn't wear out right here, now it's part of the quilt. So everybody's got a piece of the, the, of what it is that makes an energy descent action plan, which is a nice warm fuzzy quilt. And it, so there's, this image works well for pretty much everyone. It's like, oh yeah, it takes all of us. And you can create it however you want. You can do, I've had these fantasies of, you know, creating something where, you know, like a piece of art where you put each each organization's name in the quilt and do an art piece with it. So that was a really helpful image for, um, for people to grasp the difference and how we would fit. We decided not to be um, a 501c3 and instead um, have been funded by donations and just fundraising for events. And um, I think I sold books for a little while to raise a few pennies, <laughs> but that got us through. And on to Reno. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> I'm Jana Vanderhart. I'm part of Transition Reno. 
um, I guess I will be talking more about interweaving with other groups, um, working on multiple scales for us. Reno is a very diverse community. We have the riches of the rich retiring in Nevada because there's no taxes. <laughs> um, and we have the poorest of the poorest living there too. So you can, you know, down the road is the trailer park and up the road is the mansion. It's really diverse. We have a lot of ethnic diversity. Uh, we have a huge university there that brings in lots of people all the time. So there's a, f and then of course we have gambling. Let's not forget that. So we have flux of people always coming into town. But within that, there is a big or, um, or, um, kind of a sustainable minded community. And um, which is why I live there, because <laughs> I wouldn't survive without that. But uh, many of us in the initiating group um, have backgrounds somehow related to that or permaculture, which of course is also sustainability. Um, interweaving with other groups, I think when you start an initiating group, that's what you're doing. You want to create a group that has experience from all these different backgrounds, and that's what we have. We have people, permaculture people, we have people that are more um, in um, local food, we have people who are doing energy, um, people are really into reskilling. Then uh, we have a pilot <laughs> who has a totally different background. Um, so getting a group together with all these talents, a diversity of talents, so that you can reach out to bigger groups. Um, we just happen to bump into other people in the community that are, are excited, that understand that oil is a limited resource. And so trying to reach out to general people and explaining to them that we're going to run out and it's getting more expensive, what are we going to do? So what we what we end up doing, interviewing with groups, is, for instance, this project we did. This was, um, this was, <laughs> this was actually, um, this was a, a, a reach out to the Reno community, to artists in particular, um, talking about what do we envision for our community. So we had an art show, part of our town, every July, uh, Reno has a big art town event with lots of music and art and things like that. You can put it back, yeah. And this was our Visions of Future Reno. We just happened to run into people that were enthusiastic about it. Um, we um, reached out to all the artists, sent them an invite saying, we're, we're doing this event, start envisioning. Um, sending out information and here we had a huge artist reception we've as an organization never spent really a penny we always get someone who donates the place um, and we had this at City Hall we had a big uh, reception at City Hall where all the artists represented their work and talked about their vision for the future which was a really fun event so every event that we've done we just happen to meet someone in the community that says, we like that, we want to partner with you. Because, like you said, we're not an umbrella organization. We are not trying to, you know, the be, be the be, a, be all, the end all, you know. What we're trying to do is get the message out to everybody that we're going to run out of oil. Oil's going to get more expensive. Who's going to pay for that? Some people can pay for it, no problem. <laughs> you know, but lots of people are not going to be able to pay for that. So how can we as a community get together and share resources so that there's enough for everyone? And that's really what we, what we work on on all these projects. We can sit back and wait for things to happen or we can start envisioning, like what do we want in our instance what do we want Reno to look like in five, ten years? Uh, so there's that banner, <laughs> if you didn't see it earlier. <laughs> We're really good banner makers, and we, do <laughs> we don't want to use the vinyl. <laughs> we hate vinyl because it's a poison plastic, so we just find old curtains and draw them up. Um, so we're actually heading for our unleashing. Ah! <laughs> and, um, you know, it's so inspiring to uh, go to the tr uh, Transition US website and just 
get information of what have people done. Because the experiences of others is worth so much. So what we do, did is we understand there's lots of groups already doing great things in our community. We want them to be at that unleashing. In fact, we need them to invite all their memberships to come because we <laughs> want lots of people there. So what we did is we made a big dinner, invited all these local groups, and gave them food, which anyone will show up for food, believe me. We invited them for food in, um, in our backyard, and then we uh, told them what we wanted to do at the Unleashing. Again, envisioning a future for Reno. What's that gonna look like? And we want them to be there, and they're going to have actually, as a thank you for them to inviting their groups, they're going to, we're going to have a local group parade, it's called. They're going to be able to go on stage and for five minutes explain what their group does and how to get in touch with them. Um, and so we are gearing up for the unleashing. I think that was all I had, right? So <laughs> um, we'll go next. Who wants to go next? Jim or Kathy? I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm Jim Newcomer. I'm from Portland, um, and um, uh, there's about let's see, Jeremy, David. Yeah, I'm thinking of who was in the the founding group, um, and um, three of us had been on the Portland Peak Oil Task Force or worked with it. Um, so we had a grounding in the. Uh, in the sort of research into, into the effects of peak oil on a city that you get when you get the transit com company coming in to tell you what transportation or the police coming in and tell you what emergency vehicles will do with, you know, with diminished fuel and what kind of rationing questions will come up, whether it's by price or by allocation and so forth. Um, so we had this grounding in um, what makes a city vulnerable but also makes it run in good time so um and also as some of you the rest of you have we have uh, you know lots of i mean portland's famous for its green groups <laughs> you can't avoid them on the other hand i must say we've had trouble establishing relations with with many green groups those who were close to us the center cnrg and um, the peak oil group from which this really started originally. There was a peak oil study group that was ongoing for a couple of years that actually pushed the city to start that peak oil task force. Ger Jeremy was behind that. So we had that grounding, but we're still working on how to reach out to the other green groups. Um, just parenthetically, we're starting an initiative now to have a celebration on 10-10-10. You know, 350.org is having a major worldwide work party that day. So we've uh, put up uh, a piece on their website saying Transition Portland is going to have a celebration. Bring your photos and your video clips and we'll drink beer and have a potluck dinner and everybody will you know, get to show what they're doing, thinking we'll attract lots of green groups. Well, we attracted two giants right away, um, uh, the Sierra Club in Portland and uh, Climate Solutions, our branch from Olympia, called us and said, let's get together and talk this over because we want to have a celebration too. So fine, great, you know, we're going to support their celebration and we come in uh, and we will through that get to know a lot of the green groups that were not in. And we too came up with this quilt um, uh, thing on our own. So we're so glad that you brought it up because all of a sudden it, it reinforces what we're thinking. We've had um, initiatives going in two directions, one toward the city and citywide um, uh, operations and support of government, and one toward local groups. And we're still experimenting on that. I think we're beginning to show some traction, but it, it takes an enormous amount of work. So first I'll talk about our initiative, our biggest initiative toward the city. The um, city government came out with a draft plan, was it a year and a half ago? How long ago was this? Okay. April of last year. April of last year, a climate action plan. The city was planning its response as a city and county, Multnomah County, to uh, climate um, change. The draft was kind of wishy-washy. And they were holding public hearings around town where people could ask questions, and that was going to be their public input. So we got the idea of holding sessions where people could actually discuss 
the various facets of the plan and make informed comments. So we did that. It took a lot of work and it came off really well. We had about 70 people participating on two hot summer nights. Um, we divided up into the, the elements that were in the plan, which made a lot of sense. One was land use and transportation, one was food, one was like that. And we had about eight or well, seven or eight people in each group, but we had people who really knew what they were doing. I mean, it was amazing to me who was sitting around the table with me on transportation and land use. We had people who had been land use planners for East County who knew the history of all the mistakes made along our max line out there, why the crime is high in the zoning relation. We had people who um, had known about how the trees in various areas had been planted and chosen and you know just everything people were there we had the people who had drafted the original plan and then been washed down by the or washed out by the politicians who didn't want to be too radical so they knew what had gone into it and and um, we came out of that we took notes we published the notes to ourselves and came back the next week and and you know discussed that and published final reports on each one plus an overview and we told the city government frankly this is a friendly gesture we're here to support what you're doing with informed comment. And they took it that way, and they made the most radical changes in a city plan anybody had ever seen. And they quoted us in the introduction. So we felt we'd really done something good for our community. We're now, there's a Portland plan now for the next 20 years that's in formation. They've done a lot better, actually, on reaching out to people in an open discussion format. You know, with like voting that you see on the screen when you do a little click, all that stuff. Um, and we're kind of working toward a participation in that at the last stages. Jeremy, you want to talk about that? Uh, sir, I was just going to do a shout out. But, um, well, also just in terms of one of the ideas about sharing the nifty things is actually because of the Climate Action Plan forums that Liz helped spearhead. Uh, as part of the Portland plan, they're actually um, that they're actually setting up a community group presentations largely because of the success that we did for the Climate Action Plan forums. So basically, you kind of present the model to the city and let them run with it. Um, and was there anything else, Jim, you want me to mention? No, I, well, okay, I cool. that's just, just what's going on in the future. I want to, oh yeah, the food initiative, Jeremy. He's, he works for the county. He's like, sets, he's like the programmer for the whole county, so he knows everything well, no, that's no, going no. on. Well, actually, no, I sit, um, I'm not in the sustainability group, but I'm, um, I'm getting uh, signals to scoot this way. Um, but I sit, my cube is like two down from the director of the sustainability group. And a lar in large part because of the food that, the, the great feedback we provided for the Climate Action Plan, um, I'm on the steering committee for the Multnomah Food Initiative. And also in terms of uh, talking with city, uh, the city officials, they pretty much only went ahead to describe transition that broader effort in the Permaculture Guild is they refer to me as I am representing the do-it-yourself groups. <laughs> Th that's, that's the only way they knew they had to translate. Wow. So, yeah, anyways, I can t I'll do an open uh, space later today about it. And we're, you know, we're still grappling with stuff like that food initiative. The county takes it on and they're really, what they're doing is cataloging the sources of food that are grown in the county, the trading channels, the purchasing units and distribution and all that sort of thing, well, that's wonderful, so we don't have to do it. And on the other hand, what's our relationship with it gonna be is still up in the air. On, I'm gonna go back to the local level because the next issue is where, where does community occur? Um, and I was trained in what they call in some weird word political science. <laughs> it's like military justice, you know. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm looking at how do you work in a city, and it's come up everywhere, you know, Bristol, Seattle, I'm sure, lots of cities. We're looking, we started, Portland has what they say is 95 neighborhood associations, what we call is 94 neighborhood associations plus the People's Republic of Sunnyside. <laughs> and, um, and Sunnyside has formed its own transition, actually, and is recognized as one of the transition units in the United States, first transition neighborhood. Um, it's bumpy, but it's going. Um, we have other groups, Liz's in the South Southeast, which is a sort of coalition of neighborhoods, and they're working toward, 
And I've visited neighborhood associations all along in Northeast Portland, which is an area of gentrification, where whites are moving in on, on blacks and it breaks up the black churches and their communities go to hell, but the whites don't have, and there's no trust in Merida. All the neighborhood associations are made up of white people. So that's a big barrier. In the meantime, of course, neighborhood associations grew up around real estate issues, keeping the property values, what happens if somebody wants to move a warehouse in or build condos or whatever. So they're not really suited for the kind of message that we have. They're not really receptive, except a few are. So, so we're still working with that puzzle. And what, one thing we've done is to invite in successful neighborhood groups, and there are some, not neighborhood associations. But there's a woman in Northeast Portland in an area that has no paved streets, um, you know, called Cully Road, and it's out by the airport, and you know, the planes <laughs> go overhead and all. Well, it turns out this one woman got started, and they invited a few neighbors in, they drank a little wine, they had the kids running around biting ankles, all the stuff kids do, had the potluck dinner. And they decided they were going to have regular potluck dinners once a month in somebody's yard outside so you don't have to clean the house. And they would start talking. And she's, she was out of work. She was indefatigable. She just went at it tooth and, until she got a job. And then others took over. But they have, in four years of existence, they, their first rule was nobody can join who's too far away to walk to one of the potlucks. So it's about a six block radius. They've had monthly potlucks for these years. They've built among them now five um, net, zero net energy houses, one of them a straw bale house. They have uh, a gardening group, which is now negotiating with the Port of Portland for space along the runway at, the, at PDX, our airport. They have a beer making group. They've gotten a grant from the city to buy the burners on which to boil the wort and also to buy dishes for their potlucks so they don't have to use paper plates. They have um, a, a knitting group. They have a group of, of uh, grown-up men who go to homes of elderly people, mostly single, to help them keep up their houses, keep the lawns, do ho home repairs. They have uh, probably six or seven other groups. They're called the Ainsworth Street Collective. And, and they have a website, right. What's it, what's it called again? Ainsworth Street, A-I-N-S-W-O-R-T-H, Street Collective. And, um, and I've been to one of their potlucks. I keep trying to get invited back, and I haven't succeeded yet. But uh, probably about 40 families represented in November. It's freezing. OK, thanks. It's freezing out there, and they're going at it. And, um, and this is a successful neighborhood group. You notice it's smaller than a neighborhood association. Another of our founding members, Jean Longley, is now working with her street to form a group around emergency planning. And this is the next step that we're looking at, is pulling neighborhoods together around emergency preparations. Uh, Oregon, as you know, has a fault line, or you may not, has a fault line off the coast very similar to the fault line off Aceh in Indonesia, or the one that just went off in Chile. So it has been 500 years since it went off, off the coast of Oregon, so we're expecting a 60-foot wall of water any day. Is it up here too? Oh, okay. So you know what we're talking about. The the main thing is there's a there is a uh, energy around emergency preparation, and it can be done in neighborhoods, and we can bring people together, and that's the first step. When they begin cooperating and you know form that kind of a backbone, we can work out from there. So we're still dealing with how do we get into neighborhoods. We're trying to figure out how to get to minority communities. I've been to a couple of minority churches and I'm told the first thing you've got to understand is these are working class people. They have no idea what you're talking about. When you say environmental or peak oil or global warming, they're like sitting there like, what? So the first thing to do is education and start holding classes or some kind of gatherings around that. So we're still working on that, you know, the series with the power of community and all the movies. And yes? Don't you have a solar cooperative in Portland that's, that's doing community solar projects? There's a couple, yeah, there's been a couple of initiatives. One is through South, Southeast, we have these um, nonprofits that 
work coalitions of neighborhood associations, and we work closely with two of them, Southeast Uplift and North Northeast Neighborhood Coalition. Southeast Uplift has had that, and Roy, where are you? Here, he's working on a similar thing in Salem, which is gonna like blow the state apart. It's just a wonderful commercial venture uh, with co cooperation from all kinds of wonderful people, and he's in a nonprofit. Do you wanna say anything about that? Anyway, yes, yeah, solar could become a part of it, and that's all, we're just inventing it as we go along. It's, <laughs> Roy McCormack uh, from Salem, Oregon. Uh, we initially did a solarized uh, re residential project, and uh, we—I don't know if anybody knows solar, but we're selling it at 550 a watt, which is about 25 percent less than you could get it just going to a business. And there, there's a talk to me later. There's a lot of benefits to doing it by the community, but we also got a lot of calls from commercial businesses looking for the same price. We were getting the same price for small units that they could get for a 10 or a 20 or an 80 kilowatt system. So they wanted in. So now we are creating uh, a whole new model for delivering energy conservation and renewable energy uh, on a larger scale. And uh, we're coming in under 550 for the uh, uh, the solar side of it. It's, it's really exciting. We're getting a lot of buy-in th from government, state, uh, the, the states. We just had a meeting with all of our Washington representatives or their their staff. Uh, the county, the, the, where the school is starting a training program for weatherization based on what we're doing. Uh, we're getting a tremendous amount of buy-in. Everybody's saying yes, let me in. Is that $5.50 installed? $5 installed, yes. $5 yeah. Is there a website uh, SolarizeSalem.org. We'll Let's take the questions later because we want to get on to one more presenter. I want to say, you know, if you think we know, if it sounds like we know what we're doing, we don't. <laughs> we're still out there on the edge. And there's three or four other things I meant to say and I just haven't been able to, but I'll turn it over to you. Am I in the right place, Tom? <laughs> I don't promise to stay here. And I'm Kathy from uh, Transition Seattle. And I have been, since this morning, hungry for that prayer. So I would like to ask you all just to take a deep breath, lower your shoulders down, close your eyes if you want to. Get into your breath again. Breathe. Oh, great spirit, earth, air, fire, and sea, you are inside and all around me. And I think we have to open our eyes again. Sorry, but we needed that. <laughs> I needed that. Um, I'm actually a wonk. <laughs> Even though I sang a song, I'm a policy wonk, I'm a city planner, um, I'm like focused on the EDAP. I mean, that's my, my thing. Um, I've been part of the group that's kind of holding together the group called Scallop Sustainable Communities all over Puget Sound. Uh, together, and if you didn't pick up a little flyer on that, uh, we have some out, out in the other room. Um, I also had the great honor to go to the transition conference in London in April 2009 and actually organized an open space on this very topic where I met people from places like Hong Kong and London, of course, and uh, Sao Paulo, and they're all struggling. We're all struggling. I mean, it's really hard. There are no answers about how you do that, you know, how you deal with your walk shed and how you deal with the kind of the greater, greater peace. And a couple of tools, oh, and also 
Cindy, who I just met for the first time this morning, uh, asked us a lot of questions uh, to start this, this panel off, and uh, she mentioned the pattern languages with Christopher Alexander and principles that you have, and I came back with some of my own principles, um, and the kind of my calling question for being here right now is, can five middle-aged white people launch a transition movement in a city? And my answer is an emphatic yes. Now, part two of that question, that in my or that kind of calling question, is um, representing a diversity of ideas, culture, stakeholders, and people takes time, money, and dedication. Should we focus more on who shows up, or spend our scarce resources on broad outreach? And I'm on the the side of. Let's do that outreach. I mean, because we do have to, since we are these five middle-aged white people in all of our groups, that's, that's where we have to kind of focus a lot of our energy is on that broad, broad outreach. Um, so tools. Uh, Christopher Alexander tools. How many people have read or kind of know the pattern language? Cool books. There's a set of three or four of them. And I haven't read them since I studied planning you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but the two that kind of came to mind in this context are uh, the idea of prospect and refuge. Um, do people know what that is? Some people do. And it comes from the savanna. It's, it's, it, you want to be on the boundary uh, looking out at the, the prospect of the whole savanna out there but you're kind of safe in the trees, but you have, so you, you get the strength from being on the boundary, but you have the prospect of the whole city or the whole place or the whole region in front of you. So you, you need that, that local walk shed, you need that local place, that, that place of refuge where you stay, and yet you have the prospect of, of the field, of the, of the savanna where you're gonna go do your grazing or hunting, depending on whether you're a carnivore or <laughs> an herbivore. And the other Christopher Alexander idea that, that I think is very relevant is uh, desire trails. And that is the idea uh, he found, Christopher Alexander found that when he was working on a college campus, that it was better, he was doing the landscape plan for a college campus, better not to put in the walkways at first. He would leave the whole field empty and then watch where people walked. And those were the places that he ended up putting the gravel down. So that's something else that I think is very relevant. You know, you have to kind of tweak it a little bit, but I think it's a very relevant um, idea for which groups kind of coalesce, which groups come along with you, where, your, where those natural desire trails are for, for, uh, for people. Um, the other, so I'm, I was thinking about tools too. Another tool that I've learned as a, as a planner, and, and this has to do actually, I've, I found out about it after I had kids. Uh, and I thought it was the schizophrenia of parenting, where you have like your home life where you go like a little crazy with your kids, and then you go back to your work life where you're supposed to be super pro professional. You know, that kind of back and forth. I don't know. If you have kids, you'll appreciate what I'm, I'm saying because it's, it is a kind of a schizophrenic mind where you're looking at the very local and then the work field. And it turns out that there's a planning term for that. <laughs> which is called mixed scanning. And it comes from a, a planner named Amatai Etzioni. <laughs> and I, I, it's a little bit like the prospect refuge thing. You look at your local, you look at your distant. You look at your local, you look at your distant. I mean, you have to go kind of back and forth. But it's the way that, that you can kind of go forward. Uh, you, you, and actually he used it for, uh, unfortunately, he was an Israeli and used it for kind of military planning of how you look, you know, in your immediate region and then how you look at your far region to see places of safety. Um, I love the idea of the quilt. We use the idea of a wheelbarrow. Uh, and I love the idea of looking for those missing pieces in a quilt. Um, 
I'm always challenged by those big missing pieces in our quilts. Obviously, you know, other people, other cultures, but also things that we seldom talk about in the sustainability community, which are the military, veterans. Um, you know, I think we're, we're a little shy, some of us, of religious groups, particularly the Mormons, which I'm like totally, you know, bring in the Mormons because they understand sustainability. Huh? They're there. And now the Tea Party. How can we use those kinds of energies? You know, how can we use the energy of these very organized, very passionate people who, you know, we have some common threads with all of them. You know, let's, let's use that kind of energy. Let's build our quilt to be as, as, as warm and as toasty and as crazy as possible. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was, was plans. I, I mentioned I'm a planning wonk and that's what I'm really like completely focused on. I just found out um, Monday that our neighborhood, um, my, my little walkshed neighborhood of, well actually it's not little, it's a, a neighborhood of 20,000 people in Seattle, but for Seattle it's a tiny little neighborhood. We got a grant to update our neighborhood plan as a sustainability plan. Yay! So, so it gives us a, that's big, yeah. Um, so we're going to be, uh, we've been talking about what that means uh, as a sustainability group, but I'm spending most of the grant money on outreach. And I'm hiring somebody to, to be working with the low income and the people at the food banks and other people who can work with the school groups and other people who can work with, even though we're kind of, we think of ourselves as a white neighborhood with a Spanish speaking population and really pull in a lot of those ideas. I like a lot of the things I learned in the last session in this room about pulling in ideas and getting people really involved in, in kind of big scale uh, plans. Um, I've been really involved, I know it's time to finish, uh, for the last, for over the summer, the thing with, with Portland and Vancouver and Seattle and probably some of your other communities too is that we have a very progressive um, city government, but they could always be more progressive. So I've been working with something called, that's a city initiative called the Carbon Neutral Community Forum. And there, we just presented our eight different areas and there were about 300 people involved in it, uh, but we presented them on land use, to, this is to the city council, land use, neighborhoods, uh, energy, green careers, transportation, food systems, zero waste, and youth. We had a couple hundred people show up for the city council presentation, and we're going to use that kind of forum uh, to help update the comprehensive plan in the city of Seattle, because I really believe that, you know, why not use the channels that they're opening for us? I guess that's the other concept that I wanted to pass along to you, which is the camel's nose. <laughs> you know about the thing, you know, the camel puts its head in the tent and, oh, you haven't heard this? Oh, so this is this, is this old Arabic kind of thing where a camel comes to the tent and the, the, the sheikh who's in the tent says, you know, I don't want you in here. And the camel says, but my nose is cold. I just want to keep my nose warm. And then the camel comes in with its head and you know, goes through the whole thing. And finally, the whole camel is inside the tent. And that's how I kind of look at what we're doing with uh, updating our comprehensive plan. They've given us, they've given us the nose with the uh, carbon neutral neighborhoods. And we're going to get the whole camel in the tent. So thank you. Cool. We were hoping to have about 20 minutes in for Q&A, um, but I wanted to point out a couple of things. One is that um, what Carolyn said earlier today, what the Transition um, US is doing is, you know, is inspiring and um, encouraging, networking. Um, that is pretty much what Transition Wacom has decided their role is to, once we got a few transition initiatives going in Whatcom County, we now have 14 transition initiatives going. And so our we're no longer an initiating group, but we're an operating group. And the operating group now, that's their job, is to inspire, encourage, network, and be a resource for all of the initiatives to start going. And um, also, we really did try 
following the handbook verbatim. There was very little deviating, and that really worked for us. But we also, whenever we needed to, we did. <laughs> we did deviate. We weren't afraid of it. Um, the other thing that um, I went to uh, the training for transition in Vancouver and um, was very impressed with one of the things that I learned, which was how important, uh, what, what kind of tools do you have to reach across barriers. Um, there's a lot of different communities in Vancouver, and one of the lessons I got out of that was the first thing to do is to support them. So in our community, that might mean um, there's a little town called Marietta that they've been struggling to be able to keep their lands. It's in a flood zone, but it's they're mostly Native Americans. So find out what their issues are, the people that you want to connect with. Find out what their issues are and go to bat for them. Build their trust. That, that's that been um, probably one of the most profound ways that I have yet heard on how to reach across. The other thing that I wanted to remind us all of is, is, is most, of it, most of the problem that's been caused is probably by the people with the lighter skin. So, you know, we're the ones that need to do most of the work, and focusing on our own work is probably more relevant than anything. Um, also wanted to mention the crazy quilt, the stitching. It's all about relationships. And that's in a crazy quilt. The history of the crazy, crazy quilt is it, rich. But the, it, the one of it, it's, it was a tool for um, mothers to teach their children how to do embroidery and do stitching and stuff. So it's about building relationships and that's an, an apprenticing. So that's another piece that fits for me for that crazy quilt. Um, the other one was bloom where you're planted. If you want to know whether or not to be a larger group or a smaller group, who are you? You know, find out who's in the room. Where are your passions? It's not, it, you know, nothing is about should and shouldn't, you know, or there's one right way. It's like, well, where are our passions at? What do we have energy for? And go from there. And um, that's it. How about some questions? And uh, Jim, Yana, Kathy, or me. So, um, Janaya? Janaya. Janaya. Cindy, we noticed on the... Uh the unleashing video that you have on YouTube from your great unleashing. An enormously long list of supporters. Mm -hmm. And our experience when we taped shows there four years ago is you have a community that's already got, I mean, way ahead of many. And so when you talked about being an umbrella and you already have all that support, how are you working now in your new structure with all the existing groups? Did you did you map them as assets? Did you know what how are you building the relationships or positioning yourself with those existing groups? At the very beginning, what we did was we um, we did a, an outreach, had an outreach committee. We called it Playing Well with Others. <laughs> and and we, we set up meetings and we wanted to find out about each group. You know, what, what, what are your mission and vision and a face-to-face. -face. And, and then if there was time, we would share who, who we were. But the focus was on finding out more about who they were and, and to see where we could build a bridge, you know, where, where we have common ground and where we might be able to partner with doing different events. One of the things that occurred out of that was the Center for Local Self-Reliance, which you can Google and find out what that is. But it's basically an urban grange. Um, it's a, a park department owned piece of property. They were going to sell the house off. A group of people got together and said, no, 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 don't do that. And uh, we'll buy it. With what? <laughs> they started doing the fundraising. The city said yes. They got the fundraising. That th they got the house. And it's going to be a site for learn teaching people how to garden and how to do different. It's about reskilling. Their, their whole focus is reskilling. Well, now that Center for Local Self-Reliance is um, likely to be the transition initiative South Bellingham. So we're just going to use that for the name. It won't be a transition name. It'll be Center for Local Self-Reliance. And all of the, the goals that they're doing is the same thing we're doing. So hey, so we've, we've just moved right in with them and supported their work. So that's some of the ways that we're playing well with others. <laughs> um, as far as umbrella versus um, crazy quilt, the crazy quilt is absolutely the way we have been stitching ourselves together. We've been um, talking a lot about um, different projects we can do with sustainable connections, for instance. We're finding some, uh, the financial issues, because they're a business network. So what, can, what are we doing with the economics? Well, they become speakers for us. They become, uh, a potential partner for micro lending, you know, things like that. So that's how we're doing it. We're stitching. We're doing the stitching. Yeah. And 
Jan, you. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate Jim's comments, and I appreciate also how important neighborhoods are in all of this. Mm -hmm. I live in Eugene, and uh, in, in, a, in a way different from Jim, I found that our that our uh, city neighborhood program has been a, a very fertile place to get the, the nose into the camel's tent because that's what we've been doing in Eugene. And I could, I could describe that uh, in more detail, but if anybody wants to ask me a little bit later, you know, how we're, we're making use of city funds to publish uh, information about permaculture and, and living more local and all that, and, and we're getting city assistance with that because we're working through our neighborhood program, and, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's something that if uh, anybody wants to know more, you know, you can just ask me how we did that. Anybody else? Shelby, you need to get, would you mind coming up? Um, I just had a quick comment to vote, uh, what you said about oh, it using the terms environmentalists and peak oil and um, things like that and just being careful because it is all about building relationships and it's so important the language that we use around that and so people may not self-identify as an environmentalist but they live those values and so I think that's just when we are building those connections looking at what people what what there is expressed in their lives and our lives and I mean thinking about my parents they wouldn't self-identify as environmentalists, but I mean, they don't waste any food. They, you know, things like that, that mm -hmm. are important, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's actually a really good skill to get when you're trying to figure out what scale or reaching across barriers is to listen to the lingo and the words that are being used. Somebody else raise their hand. I had a quick question. How did you, well, no, very quick. Uh, how did you actually build the, um, the quilt? I mean, was it around a kitchen table with lots of fabric collected, or? Just, oh. That quilt actually belongs to a, a girlfriend of mine, and her great aunt made it. Okay. So it is a, it is actually a historically Ooh, accurate. Uh, you know, the story of the crazy quilt is a beautiful story, okay. and um, so if you get a chance to research that, it'd be cool. Would you consider getting fabric from each of your? Collaborators. Yeah, we actually, I, I was actually hoping to be able to do that for the Great Unleashing, but okay. there was too many other things yeah. going on. It became Good very project. small. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just curious because I've heard a couple people say that they're not part of nonprofits or anything like that. So what do you do about liability? What do you do about having these events? You know, as things get, um, the economy gets worse, people become even more litigious, and um, they, yeah, I'm worried about those sorts of things. Another good example of partnering for the Great Unleashing, we had um, Sustainable Connections, um, I believe that was the group that did it, they, they ended up covering by way, they have an insurance policy because they're a 501c3. So they ended up, because of something else that they could do, that was a, I think, oh, no, it was a co-sponsoring trade. So they ended up, their insurance company ended up being the liability insurance for the Great Unleashing. Yeah. Yeah, I think partnership is, is major with that. Every event that we've done, we did a film series at the community college, so they took on all that liability. Um, we did this artist reception at City Hall. You know, it's free to the public. It is for the public, so there. And then the unleashing is going to be at the university. They take on the, you know, uh, take that on. And uh, being able to partner with all these groups is really, I think, is, is you know, important for that. Um, but then again, I also feel like you sh that shouldn't become something to limit you. Um, we've done street fairs with uh, collaborating with local food groups and things like that. At some point you just have to do also, like um, the people powered parade that they did. Um, you know, you just go. I mean, someone might fall and break, break something, or, but that's life. <laughs> we have to go beyond that. If we are stuck in that fear, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, so I think being able to 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 um, pass on that positive energy as opposed to focus on the negative is is really important. Of course, you don't want to forget 
all the details, but um, th that's what a lot of people are missing. Um, and coming to um, the peak oil issue, in our community, um, the, the people aren't as aware as you are. <laughs> um, you know, Reno population is really oblivious to a lot of things. We, we're not lucky like you know, Portland, Seattle, very enlightened people. So we have to start from scratch. People ask us, what do you mean climate change? What do you mean peak oil? What does that mean? They, we have to start from the beginning, you know, and give them very concrete examples. Um, yep, so that's where we come from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and I'm going to follow up on what you said while you're on your way up here. That I had a, a, an experience of going to one of my neighborhood association meetings to talk about climate, you know, transition movement. Just get them some inspiration going. And one of the neighborhoods, which happens to be very family friendly and quite well known, um, you know, multi-generational, everybody's happy, people brought food, there are lots of interactions going on, they just couldn't wait for the, the whole meeting to start happening, and there were multiple presenters, and then the next night, oh, and it was great, well received, <laughs> and the next night we went to another neighborhood that was more well-to-do, the, um, the, the whole energy there was, you know, arguing over who was going to be the next president, uh, who is going, you know, what sort of, COVID, you know, kind of hidden agendas were not being said, and do I have to go through this meeting? Political um, people were showing up, you know, to just show their face at the meeting, and um, I asked, you know, at, I, we finally got five minutes at the end, <laughs> and they said, you know, so I said, well, how many people know, trans, you know, what uh, climate change is or peak oil? No one knew what peak oil was. This is well-educated, well-to-do people. No one knew what peak oil was, and two people knew what climate change was, and that's in Bellingham. So it's not just Reno. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually live in Lake Oswego, which is a um, a well-to-do suburb in Portland. I live at the ragged end, but still, I went to my neighborhood association meeting, and that was the first reaction. What? Second reaction was because I went to the second meeting. Okay, you're now sustainability coordinator. We got to have one. <laughs> So what I started to do in my neighborhood association is, okay, let's have a picnic this summer. So that's the first action that, the, that we've taken that isn't about signs along the streets or parking in front of somebody's house or that obnoxious church over there that finally sold the bill, da, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And so you begin, there's a, little, there's a song that a woman I know wrote about a little boy in Africa who had, was born with HIV positive blood. And, he gave incredibly moving speeches to thousands of people and somebody asked him, how do you do this? And his, his reply was, <laughs> you do what you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. Mm -hmm. right. So that's wonderful. Nice but but I wanna, it's not the ending. I, because <laughs> I'll sing it again when we get there. Um, you ask about liability, and, but it brings up the whole issue of responsible funding, which has been, an, in Portland anyway, a, a long unresolved issue. What do we do about money? Do we want to have money, dirty our hands with money at all? Um, should 501c3 is, is a waste of time or it's necessary to move forward? Um, and we have never solved these issues yet, but I just want to share that because some of the rest of you may be in that quandary as well. And there are people on both sides of those issues. And it, you know, my own position is it limits what we can do. So we've just heard about in the session in there about a, a sort of a side group and we've had something like that idea too, where, you know, the Friends of Transition PDX, which could incorporate as a 501c3, fund activities, gather funds, and, and, um, and hold the, the liability as well. So, there's, because we've, we've got to dig our way out of that issue, or we're never going to have in a city, we're never going to have the, you know, ability to get publicity out, for example, or to conceive of big events that, without somebody telling us what to do. We're about uh, 11 minutes over. How are we doing, Leo? Is, should we stop it or should we? Okay. Sorry. If you have any more questions, it's Jim, Kathy, Yana, and Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. That was a great panel.